Hey there, Daniel Yang here at the Church Multiplication Institute. Uh, today, I'm hoping we're going to have a fun conversation with Ed Setzer and Alan Hirsch. I'm actually going to save the bio because most of you guys uh, already have had a lot of interaction with Ed and Alan over the years, read their books, uh, and learned quite a bit from them. Uh, but here at the Church Multiplication Institute, you know, a lot of the folks that we uh, work with, we serve, the learning communities, think tanks that we host are those that are leading church planting uh, and missional movements, you know, whether in a denomination or at a network level. Uh, some are national leaders, many are regional leaders, and many of you are thinking about how do you take some of not just your strategies and your infrastructure, but how do you take the ideas of church planting and move it forward, pass it, put it in the hands of uh, emerging young leaders. And so that, uh, in, in, in a way, has been the conversation that we've been helping to navigate with many church planning organizations and movement leaders. And so I'm really excited to, ha to have this conversation with Ed and Alan today about the past, the present, and the future of the missional, uh, missional movement. And I think that it's, it's pertinent for us to have this conversation now because there are a lot of the things that we talk about in church planting and in mission uh, is getting lost in translation by the time we, with, with Gen Z. And even though we're not going to talk specifically about Gen Z uh, uh, in, in this conversation, a lot of the ideas that what we're hoping to do at the Church Multiplication Institute is to make mission and to make church planting um, in the vernacular, make it much more easier for young leaders to understand. And uh, we've seen at least one version of that in the missional movement here in North America. You might argue that for Gen Xers and older millennials, the missional movement was a part of mobilizing and getting uh, a lot of uh, younger leaders in the 90s and early 2000s in the missional stream, but specifically also in the church planting stream. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually do a case study of the 20 years of the missional movement here in North America. What was it? Uh, what did it produce? And uh, what parts of it should we be uh, using and, and moving forward, taking with us into the future, especially as we hand off the baton for many of you as you're thinking through this, uh, to the next generation of leaders. So um, I'm going to just jump into this conversation, and uh, I'll start with you, Ed. Um, uh, what 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 is the missional movement? And specifically, uh, how was it introduced in the North American context? So, you know, key figures, yeah. books, practitioners. Yeah. Well, we'll yeah, yeah, you have to think in terms of um, when was it introduced to evangelicals, which is a different conversation from when the ideas and the concepts began to emerge. So, I mean, it's actually a Bardian idea that the mission was rooted in the identity of God himself. So this was sort of a pretty widely held view. If you look at the Willingen Missionary Conference, the terms uh, Missio Dei weren't used there, but the concept was very clearly evidenced there. So, but what seemed to have happened was, so think in terms of that's the kind of the mainline prevailing view, what we call the conciliar missions movement. So then, um, I think it was actually Jonathan Lehman put this, used this phrase, which I thought was helpful, that some people kind of took it out of the, pl uh, the pot, the plant out of the pot of the main line and planted it in evangelicalism. And I think you have to say that Daryl Guder was a significant part of that, kind of a bridge figure uh, between uh, evangelicals and mainline Protestantism. The first person to write a book who is an evangelical using the word missional the way we use it today would be Francis DeBose at, um, at uh, Golden Gate at the time in God Who Sends. It wasn't really, didn't really get picked up a lot. Uh, and so then you'd probably uh, then want to look at um, uh, Van, Chuck Van Engen in God's Missionary People. That was in the 90s. Uh, God Who Sends was in the 80s and the 90s. And then Guder's book. But I, but I think ultimately, I mean, again, I don't want to be nice to Alan, who's our other conversation partner here. But I think Alan and Mike Frost, their book, The Shape of Things to Come, Really, uh, it was also too, because remember, the Missional Church Guter's book was this multi-authored, you know, this right. resource. And so I think that that became more and more mainstream. And uh, and then it, you know, kind of branched into different ways. Is actually, people have made family trees. And and Alan and I are typically on those family trees. Sometimes in places we don't, we say, oh, I wouldn't put myself on that side of the family tree or whatever. Maybe we want to be on all the trees. I don't know. Um, so I think that it became to the place. And I, I certainly think like the, if we use missional as the adjectival use of mission or missio day, even Lausanne, you know, Christopher Wright, I mean, this is just mainstream that idea of mission. So now conciliar, which would be mainline Protestant, but conciliar is the term we use when it comes to missions from world council conciliar Catholic, 
uh, and evangelical all would be very shaped by the idea that mission is rooted in the identity of God himself, that we join Jesus on his mission. You know, as evangelicals, we'd be conversionary Protestants, so that expresses itself a little bit differently. And, um, and that's how it was introduced. Mm -hmm. We can talk later how it was co-opted, but yeah. if that, that, might, that might be helpful to, to start the conversation. Yeah, yeah. So Guter, Van Egan, I mean, uh, Alan, what else? I mean, uh, what are the key figures and then and, and what, what, what was it? Yeah, so, um, yeah, for me, actually, I, uh, uh, how, how do you improve on what, what uh, Ed Stetzer says on these things? I, I mean, and he's got a handle on the, the um, I guess, the kind of the theological uh, development and evolution of the idea. Uh, totally correct. Uh, for me, I think I was introduced to it uh, much more by being immersed in a situation which demanded, I think, differently. And uh, um, which... We can come to it maybe later if you're interested, but um, but forced me to kind of look for alternatives. And I think uh, for me, David Bosch, the South African missiologist, which I think a lot of people point to as being a very significant voice, certainly uh, you know was a great read for me and really really gave me language for what I was struggling with. And then I think particularly uh, Newbegin, um, uh, who was a missionary, of course in um, in in India for many many years, returned to the UK where he came from, and began to realise that actually the, that the United Kingdom and and hence the um, the Western context itself was in, in need to be uh, re-evangelised and uh, and that it, it itself um, um, you know even though I used the kind of imagery of um, of a stone that had been immersed in water for 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 you know centuries and then but you you pick up the stone and you know you break it open and it's still dry on the inside and you would say that effectively um european culture uh, had resisted the, uh, the 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 gospel and that it, it needed to be thoroughly re-evangelized and that seemed, made a lot of sense to me um, and and is a wonderfully articulate man. So I, I think uh, yeah, uh, he would be the one I'd look to. For me, um, 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 I think the big insights uh, were, uh, particularly from Bosch, the idea that mission uh, is not just a subset of ecclesiology, um, as in the doctrine of the church. It's not something which only the church does, but of theology proper. That is, it's who God is. That uh, the missio dei, of course, is the idea that God is Himself a missionary, and this in Trinitarian terms as well. Uh, and then, uh, for me, the other thing that very important as a practitioner, more than a theologian, um, uh, that mission is an organizing principle uh, of the church. Um, prior to this, would might have been worship services or community which are all, all very important, but I, I, that as organizing principles, I believe that if you organize around mission, you get the other ones thrown in because you become a community that we were intended to be by actually pursuing the mission that, that only the church can fulfill. We're, we're a certain people that only we can fulfill. We're apostolic in the in the historic sense of the word. Um, yeah, so, uh, then, okay. of course, Guder, I would throw in too. Guder's been you know, amazing. Yeah, and a difference, though, between Guder and, so Bosch and Newbegin. Uh, Bosch writes Transforming Mission, for those who are listening to the conversation, which is the Summa Missiologica. It is yes, the it is. resource that, um, that shapes so much of missiological conversation. So we answer the questions a little differently. Alan answered the question about the understanding of mission, mm -hmm. and I answered the question about introducing the idea to evangelicalism. So all of what Alan described, like organizing the congregation around mission, was actually present in the World Council of Churches, missionary structures of the congregation prog project that kind of flowed out of Willingen in the early 50s. So again, history doesn't repeat itself, it tends to rhyme. Mm -hmm. So this, these ideas have been around for decades. I, I think they're rooted in the biblical text. Um, but these ideas have been around for decades. But for evangelicals, just for a handful of decades, for his mainline Protestants, longer. So some people who are concerned about the missional church conversation, their concern is often built around right. the fact, well, it didn't work out so well for when I when right. I talked to Daryl Guter. Uh, I don't know. I wrote this in a book somewhere. I talked to Daryl Guter, and he would say, I mean, part of what he wanted to do was to recast the mission and use the word missional because mainline Protestants, conciliar people tended not to use the word missional. They use the word missio dei, mm -hmm. sometimes missional. But what Guder wanted to do is not make the mistakes of conciliar. Remember, conciliar means mainline Protestant, council of churches. He wanted to 
help people not make the mistakes and get, get the emphasis on mission. I asked Francis DuBose before he died um, that same question. He said, well, I, I wanted to take the best of the conciliar missions understanding of the Missio Dei, use the word missional. He actually used the word missional to cast it in a different way, to sound different, so that, and if he was an evangelical, so that evangelicals could learn the truths without making the mistakes of the conciliar missions movement, which mm -hmm. is something that Alan and I are both very passionate about because this didn't end well in contexts right. that embrace this without having a fully orbed focus on sharing the gospel, evangelism, a clarity on the cross and more. So let's talk about on that, uh, if I may, uh, just- uh, Sure, sure, go ahead. Yeah, we have see, we're jumping in now. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, Daryl Gouda, um, such a wonderful guy too, by the way. Uh, I think he's, he's new begins inheritor in many ways. Yeah. But, um, 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 I think what 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 the Church in Our Culture Network, which is an American expression, would, they were interested in in, in Newbegin's kind of um, challenge, but they introduced uh, us into the idea of how does this impact the church, and I would say here is that it it, it seems to me that they they weren't able to address the ecclesiology, even yeah. though they wanted to. Good. So that I think is where it fundamentally failed is they were a, a, unable to create forms that were consistent with mission. And so, you know, whether it be Presbyterianism or Anglicanism or whatever it was, it fundamentally, the forms were pretty much non-missional and, 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 and basically deeply entrenched. They It failed to address the forms and reform the church. And I think that was a problem. Yeah, good insight. Uh, eventually, where, where I want to go is uh, helping uh, leaders think through what's the grand narrative that's going to mobilize mm. the next generation. I, I want to eventually get there. Uh, but we're going to reverse engineer starting with your personal stories, because in some ways, so uh, both you, Alan, Ed, um, and you might maybe Keller, but Keller probably uh, used the word less. Um, and there's a few others there. Um, you you help bring the idea of missional to market. At least to evangelical. Oh, that right. phrase just makes me twitch to market. But that's, <laughs> but I would say, but I would say I did that in ways that were often unhelpful. So I would agree. I popularized the term uh, in doing so in ways that now I would do differently. But I but I think that's fair. Okay. So um, and we're going to get to yeah. that. I mean, yeah. um, your personal narrative. Mm -hmm. Like, what was it about? the idea of missional, the organizing the church around mission. You, you maybe, I don't know how you grew up. I don't know what the church experience for you. I know, Ed, you came to Jesus later. Um, but what was about the idea of uh, the Missio Dei, the, the, the mission of God that captured you so much that at least in the early part of your, 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 your personal ministry and then later your writings, like you centered a lot of what you did around being missional. I mean, you wrote a book that had, had the word missional in it. So... I wrote like um, seven books that had the yeah. word missional. So, so yeah. personal yeah. narrative. I mean, what was it? Was there a shift in your thinking? Alan first, I guess. Yeah, this is Alan first. Alan. Alan's yeah. older. Yeah. Alan's yeah. Alan. He's older than me. Okay. you, Alan, then we'll come back. Uh, and I actually tell you, South Melbourne Restoration Community. I could tell some Alan. Oh, gosh. Right. There you go. That's right. What a memory. Alan. That's the thing is with Ed. You, you, there's no, you guys got a kind of perfectly photographic memory. It's ridiculous. But anyway. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, uh, and by the way, poor Daniel, you, you're kind of stuck with us, the lords of the long answers. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We it's rule. True. <laughs> so this whole 45-minute video, is, I don't work for Alan and me. <laughs> this is why, I should say, this is why Alan teaches for us. That's right. He's, he teaches in our, in our Missional Church Movements program where he gets to have 40 hours, gets 40 hours. to answer yeah. questions. Right. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. So, the, the, okay. so here's, here's an attempt at a shorter answer. Um, um, I think for me, uh, it, it really came about from being uh, two things. I came out of seminary, uh, a, a perfectly useless degree uh, that, uh, well, you know, taught me maybe how to handle some scripture and, and, and church history and some some philosophical ideas. But uh, I didn't even, they didn't teach preaching. So, I mean, I was useless. I mean, you know, all the basic things of a local pastor, but we went to an inner city church, uh, which, yes, as the head said, became known as we changed its name to South Melbourne Restoration Community, which then became a church planting movement in the inner city. But um, but, but being immersed in an inner city context um, uh, where you had, um, you know, a huge amount of different subcultures around about us, um, and most of them somewhat alienated from the gospel, as it, as Australia anyway, but, um, but you know, in a sense, we felt like we were in like a subcultural version of Papua New Guinea. Now, Papua New Guinea, just to, for those who don't know, is 
a relatively small um, country, uh, maybe like a small American state, um, but it has about uh, a thousand different uh, language groups. It's a phenomenal. Um, and it's an anthropologist dream, but a missionary's nightmare. Uh, and 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 uh, there was the metaphor for us. We were found ourselves in this context, which was so complex, and we were trying to reach LGBTQ, all the rest now, we call them now, but anyway, the gay community, uh, and everything from that to street people and Jewish people, and and we managed to plant churches among them all. But um, but it was like Papua New Guinea, and we had to, it was a challenge. Uh, so it, it forced, I was forced in it by context. The other uh, thing, and I think I was, you know, paying for my many sins. Um, I I got a, a role with my denomination uh, in charge of mission education and development, um, which really was about the church development and, and church growth and church planting and, and leadership development in the local church, right? So a big challenge for a 36-year-old. But, um, but basically that gave me the helicopter view. And uh, because uh, from there I had to kind of look at the kind of the inherited understanding of the church and how there was this mismatch. And this is where Newbegin became exceedingly useful for me because uh, I began to see the flaws at the level of whole system. Uh, so on the ground, I was learning, you know, the non-adaptive ecclesiology that I'd inherited was not suited to our context and needed to change. We were forced into that through contextual church planting, what I call incarnational forms of mission. Uh, and then, so we learned that very practically, and then I had to learn very practically leading a denomination's missionary efforts um, uh, and all that. So that forced me. I think the two of them together uh, had a huge impact upon me. Yeah, so mine probably, um, interesting similarities, though, church planning is, is a similar part of that as well. And I think one of the things that I... Uh, I was pleased to contribute to the conversation was what was originally called planning new churches in a postmodern age. Uh, that was a thing for a while, postmodern, but then renamed to planning missional churches. And I think planning missional churches got the issues better than breaking the missional code, but that's another story for another day. So, so it kind of, for me, I started, Don and I moved to the inner city of Buffalo, New York, planted a church among the urban poor. And what we found was the prevailing narrative of that day was shaped by the church growth movement. And I actually spoke at the 50th anniversary of the publication of Bridges of God, which is McGavern's mm -hmm. kind of seminal work that launches the church growth movement. And so I spoke at Fuller Seminary at the American Society of Church Growth. And it, it was in some sense what I wrote was, was biographical. And I wrote, the, I think the title was The Growth the birth, the growth, and the death of the church growth movement, mm. which again, I was speaking this at the American Society for Church Growth, uh, which has now renamed itself. And, but, but the point was, is I grew into ministry at a time when the church growth movement, and that's like a movement. When we say church growth, when Alan says church growth, when I say church growth, we're not meaning growing churches. Right. Um, right. There's a movement that McGavern sort of launched, who was a missiologist. C. Peter Wagner sort of took over it, become, it became much more methodologically driven, mm -hmm. formulaic, uh, almost, I would say, methodological mania. And so that was the where I kind of come came up in. And, you know, I'm planting a church as a bivocational contractor doing home insulation and renovation. And I'm still reading these things. I'm like, I, these things are not all. This, my experience in, here what Alan said, contextual church planting led me to a, saying something's not here where I'd want it to be. So planted another church in, uh, suburb of Erie, Pennsylvania, um, began to uh, do some more. Re I was actually studying with Elmer Towns, one of the one of the the, the godfathers of the church growth movement. Uh, did a master's degree with him, and see, let me say, deeply thankful for 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 his um, speaking into my life and helping my learning. Uh, when I did, uh, when I was in Erie, Pennsylvania, I did a doctor of ministry and started to engage more of the missiological literature. Some of the things I wrote. But it was actually when I was doing my PhD, uh, one of the professors there, actually I, I dedicated planting new churches in a postmodern age to someone that most of our listeners wouldn't have heard of. His name is Mark Terry. Mm -hmm. uh, he's written several, John Mark Terry, History of Evangelism. And the dedication to planting new churches in a postmodern age, it actually tells you of the mental shift that I was going through. I, I wrote, I knew the hows of church planting, but you taught me the whys of mission. And I think that was the shift. It was reading uh, God Who Sends, um, which just rocked me. It's like mission is rooted in the identity of God himself, again. 
And so, so I think though, it's interesting though, for both of us. And I think for a lot of people, it was the church planting conversation, which in some ways was a different path and maybe rejected some of the assumptions of the church growth movement that caused us to look more deeply to mission. So when I did my PhD, um, people said to me, why aren't you, I mean, the church growth was the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Fuller Seminary is all about the church growth movement, the church growth institutes. And, and I, I look at it and I said, I don't want to do a PhD in church growth. That was the thing. Most of those are gone now. Mm-hmm. And I said, I, I think mission is the discipline that we're going to need to engage the cultural moment. And later I would say to engage any and all cultural moments, but at that time to engage the cultural moment. So I went the path to be a missiologist, which was Back then, I mean, now, you know, PhD is a mission. Well, you're getting well, your PhD yeah. in that. Yeah. But, but when, when I was in my 20s and started down this path, PhDs and missions didn't do it in Western culture focused. Right. And right. so, I'm not, I think there were just like a handful of us. And people thought, why'd you do your PhD? Why'd you study missions if you're going to be focused on Western culture? Um, and so, so still to this day, um, I'm thankful that I think church planting led me to the missional conversation. And probably my first articulation of that is in the little blue book called Planting New Churches in a Postmodern Age, which someone said to me, because it, it actually, I mean, and the book really sold a lot of copies. I mean, I was really surprised. It was, a, it was actually an academic book. But someone said to me, a pastor of an established church, he said, I, I read it for the half that was about mission. And that was their introduction. It was sort of the, the gateway into the mission conversation was in and around contextualized church planning. And I think Alan's story kind of resonates. Yeah, with yeah. A lot of, lot of overlap and similarities. So, you know, missional movements, organizing uh, church around the idea uh, God's a sending God, God's a God on mission. And then also uh, seeing the West as, a, as a, a, a mission field, I guess. You know, so these are some of the, the big ideas that are taking shape. They're seeping into you. Um, and those things you just said, 40 years ago, people would be, find those controversial. Sure. And now probably everyone listening is like, well, of course you should see the West as a mission field. So yeah. it is, the shift is substantive. That's right. That's right. So from your perspective, I, I'll go to you, Ed, and then we'll go to Alan. Um, what would you say that church growth, uh, the church growth movement, uh, or whatever was the next iteration, denominational church planting, did they co-opt missional? Was it just an add-on to church growth methodology? Um, you know, is there, is there any truth to, to the movement being co-opted in some way? Maybe mainstreamed. Yeah, so I, I actually think the church growth movement was a response to a poor, I, mean, I don't think. I mean, historically, the church growth movement was McGavern's response to mission becoming everything. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, Stephen Neal has a famous quote, when everything is mission, nothing is mission. So you can't just, right now, at our ages, we look at the church growth movement and we all kind of emerged out of that, but don't caricature the church growth movement. The church growth movement came out of an understanding of mission right. that was shaped from the conciliar missions movement, shaped out of Willingen, the missionary conference at Willingen, that actually made mission everything. It was separate from the church. Um, it was... And so the church growth movement said no. So Tur- McGavern's book was on church growth was one of them was later renamed Effective Evangelism. Mm-hmm. So McGavern wanted to see people become followers of Jesus in Christian communities. So I very much relate to McGavern. Sure. And I as a, but he remember he was a missiologist. So Newbegin's story is a lot like uh, a lot like McGavern's story. McGavern focused on conversion and conversion of people groups, right. which he we... He was in India also. He was in India also. And we would look today at, if we read McGavern's book without seeing where it went in the church growth movement as missiologists, we, I think all, all three of us use that term to describe ourselves, we'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm tracking with that. So, so the church growth movement was a response to the, um, the, the, the Missio Dei movement in many ways, and the missional church movement was a response to the church growth movement and that it became so pra- pragmatic, mm-hmm. so a-theological, um, so methodological mania. And so it said, how do we rediscover the richness of the Missio Dei? What is it? I mean, so we start talking about theology of mission again, which is what they talked about in response, I think, with errors that caused the church growth movement to overcompensate. So I, I always, I, I think it's real important too, because everyone... Because at the time, 
people said this is the right response to the last error. Mm -hmm. And then this becomes the error in response to the last error. Right. And then, but so we're walking in a stream right now where we're making the right response to the last error, but 10 years from now, someone's gonna come along 20 years from now and make the response to our error where we overcompensated as well. Unfortunately, it is a very much a pendulum. These yeah. things do happen. So yeah. Alan yeah. probably wanna to add to that. Alan, your thoughts, you know, and part of it is sometimes uh, you know, we'll see a denomination slap on the word missional to everything, some, something that they're doing, yeah. right, everything, <laughs> uh, or a title, um, yeah. and um, and it may not be exactly what at least missional was trying to, to accomplish, and so what are your thoughts in terms of that particular phenomenon? Yeah, I think I think it, uh, there's no doubt there's been some real level of corruption, not without some Successes, I think it has already pointed out, it has changed the conversation and has brought the idea of mission back into the equation, which largely in the Western church, it had pretty much and didn't have the language there. I mean, the fact that we forgot that God was a missionary God, the Missio Day was the discovery of the 20th century, really? It was so much part of the scripture, you know? Yeah, oh yeah. The, you know, the father sent the son, the sons and the father send, that's the word of mission. And that we are sent, you know, that, that means it's so obvious to us now, but I mean, you, you realize how, I don't even know how we forgot it. But um, so, yes, I think there was some co-option, there has been some success, but um, but I think it it, it became, um, yeah, just, you know, it, it, with a very pragmatic church growth folk who just thought, well, this is the next thing. And I think the great danger and, and in any scenario, and, and particularly in the shift from the non-missional ecclesiology, and I actually would put church growth in there as well. I you know, maybe don't know whether it agrees with that, but I see it as an extension of the Christendom form of church. It was just the uh, adding of the evangelistic function. So evangelism. I, I could agree with that. Yeah. Well, well, you know, it's interesting. Eddie Gibbs, uh, who was one of the fathers of church growth theory, I remember he said this to me in his very perfect English accent. He said, talking about church growth or what we call the contemporary church. He says it's a it's it's a pig with lipstick, but it's still a pig, you know. And what he meant is not like it's insulting. It's just saying it's the same beast. It's just got all the lipstick on it. And I think that's the truth. I didn't think, uh, you know, church growth really was a change of the game. In fact, that was the mistake. McGovern understood it, but yeah, I don't think Wagner did. And I think, you know, so I would say, you know, if I if we look at our a way of thinking about the church has always got a steeple, always got a pulpit, always got a worship band. Well, that's of course church growth, and um, and the problem is it's uh, you know it's a singular understanding of the church. It's a single model. God has used it without without question, but it's now plucked all the low hanging fruit, and we need, we're going to need to climb the tree now to get the fruit, and that requires a genuinely missionary response. So, I would say. Uh, Dan, it's been co-opted, but you know what? There's no plan B on this. Where do we go back to? What, are we going to go back to church growth? Well, we're seeing the outcome of that now. It's interesting that uh, Drucker um, said this. He said that whom the gods will destroy, they give 40 years of success. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I think it's true. I think it's the we're seeing the end of the era of church uh, church growth now. And actually probably more now than ever before, we need the, the missional conversation. Mm. So let's go to recent history. Let's go to to, to the 2000s. So, so read that recent history, because my, my kids history. think of that as the oldies, but <laughs> no, yes. But I'm to be, to, to <laughs> the Old history, Testament. But it's recent. Yeah. So, um, you know, Alan, you're you're still on, on route to the U.S., so you're not even here yet. You, you wrote Shaping of Things to Come. 2003, I think, with, with Frost. Is that right? 2003? That's right, yeah. It was published. Grand Ways comes out uh, 2006. Um, but there's already a lot of energy, I think, in terms of uh, church planting that's starting to shift a little bit. Uh, you probably, you know, um, Bob Logan's, uh, you know, uh, church planting toolkit probably is... is best, yes. best selling resource in the history of church planting. Is, is helping to kind it's of... It's a cassette. Alan, cassettes. You remember those little things? Yes, I, I remember those, those cassettes. Yeah. With the wheels and yeah. the little... Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So there's Absolutely. some energy there already that's kind of priming the pump. Um, so let's reflect on that decade. And this is important because I'm, I'm trying to tie this, like, you know, uh, decades to, to, to the ages of people. Yeah. And so... Interesting, by the way, that Bob Logan would sound a lot like Alan Hirsch today too. So yeah, yeah, so, yeah it's, it, it, I mean, and, and let me just be fair. And Alan Hirsch sounded a lot like Bob Logan. In other words, he's kind of 
walk through some of the same currents and conversations. Yes, he has. Yeah. 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 So again, two, uh, 20 years ago, you've got, you got some young leaders emerging. They're probably in their late 20s, uh, maybe some of them in their early 30s. Uh, the both of you are writing in this space at this point. I'm not, I'm not early 2000. I'm not. I'm I'm still finishing my dissertation. Okay. Okay. And so, and I'm reading. I, 2003. I'm reading shaping uh, shaping of things, shaping to, things come. to come. Yeah. Yep. Um, I don't think I think that's right. Now I'm going to look. Oh, God. Yes, so we we got some key figures that are uh, in a sense. Uh, I know you don't like the term, but mainstreaming missional at least making it. Well, I didn't. Marketing was the term we marketing, didn't like. Yeah, you brought right. it to market. Yeah, Ma- marketing, mainstreaming, yeah, I think, is an acknowledgement of reality. So uh, you, you know, you could throw a couple of names in there. Uh, you know, whether it was somebody like a Driscoll or there's probably a few others that are mm-hmm. using the language. I'm um, wrong. I'm wrong. I wrote planning new tourism. It came out in 2003. 2003. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, but so. I was writing that and my dissertation at the same time. The same so time. right around that time. Um, let's talk about what are some of the, some, some of the good things. The, n- give me names of leaders, give me names of movements. People tried to pioneer things. You know, the term missional community became, uh, used more like as you reflect on that particular decade in the two thousands, like what were some of the helpful things that came out at Ed- first, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, people started picking, making family trees and, and part of the challenge is, is that in the middle of, in my, in my view, in the middle of the missional church conversation, the emerging church came along. Mm-hmm. And I think that those things were both intertwined, uh, maybe understood in ways that were unhelpful. Um, so so some of the missional church conversation, you know, you look at like uh, Leadership Journal did a uh, missional family tree. Um, and, and and in that, it was kind of interesting because it, it listed, um, it came out of Gooder. Um, I don't think Alan was listed on there, but Exiles by Mike Frost was, which is uh, and He's forgotten ways right next to it. Oh, is there a forgotten ways right there? Okay, good. Um, and so you can kind of get a picture of, and I'm looking at it right now, and they kind of shaped it. And, and I would say, I would look at this now and say, I don't know that that was, I, I would have framed it differently. And they were gracious towards, towards me and some of my co-authors and, and towards Alan, forgotten ways is right at the top of missional communities. But I think in and around there, some names like uh, who helped mainstream it would be Milford Minitry. Um, would be, um, of course, Craig Van Gelder, then the Ministry of the Missional Church, not God's Missionary People, which was in the 90s and didn't get as noticed until later. I certainly think that's there. Um, you know, and, and the question, too, is where you put, like, someone like Neil Cole or, yeah, right. you know, Wolfgang Simpson. Where do you put those people who were calling for alternative ecclesial expressions but weren't necessarily engaging until later a uh, more ro- uh, a robust theology of the Missio Dei? So, or organic church was an, a, a new framing and a and certainly had missional components to it. So I think that's where it gets complicated. So in that very much pure missional lane, uh, I, I would have put, if I was doing the family tree, I would have put the shaping of things to come more prominently there, at least for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a key part. So here I am finishing a PhD in missiology, and I'm like, oh, that's, yes. And I, I, could, I could see and hear that, and that helped me to frame some of my thinking uh, around it. So those are some of the things I'd put. Uh, yeah, I forgot ways right at the top. I apologize for missing that, Alan, but I was, I was trying to pull up the tree. My point is, is that I think there's a lot of things that I wouldn't have put on that tree that they did and things that I would put more in that they didn't. And I think, for example, the shaping of things to come to me is a key framing. Um, the missional church, I think introduced the language yeah. uh, in the title even. Um, but yeah, shaping things to come became really challenging to me. Yeah. Alan, reflecting on the early 2000s, um, yeah. what are some of the moments there for you? Yeah, I, I think um, yeah, just, just just a bit of history behind Shaping. Um, shaping came out uh, pretty much out of um, our frustration in, in, in trying to find tools that really were a- enabled us to be able to do the contextualized church planting that we needed to do. Um, and it was around church planting and other forms of mission endeavor. Um, but all we had was Bob Logan, actually, at the time. I mean, there was very little. And, and Bob Logan stuff, and he would confess this now, as, as you've already said, Ed, uh, it was very one-dimensional, and it, it really had presumed that ecclesiology was correct. It never really asked any questions about the prevailing ecclesiology. In fact, it front-loaded it, and I think that's the problem, is that um, ecclesiology is important, but it's got to be, um, I think, a subset of missiology. We do mission and the church emerges from our missionary endeavors, not the other way around. So we don't front load a model of church. 
And so we we just didn't have anything to uh, to build. So we wanted um, at the time, uh, Mike and myself, we started Forge Mission Training Network out of the frustration that we just simply had no material, and we felt we needed to train uh, incarnational church planters uh, for Australia. And and so we developed our own curriculum, and that was really what it was. Um, we did some research for it. We did a couple of trips around the world and met people and interviewed them and all. And there were some fascinating people trying to collect their stories and, and compare notes. And you realize that actually God was doing something quite significant. Um, it wasn't just us, but we were naming, partly because of the difficulty of our context, um, um, you know, the, demanded a missionary response. Um, so that's a bit of shaping. So, and, and, and really, it was a book that probably, you know, dropped at the right time. Interestingly, Ed, you, you appreciate this, we actually delivered it um, in 2001. Um, huh. And the uh, Hendrickson was the publisher at the time. They were nervous about this. It's too radical. So they actually were going to dump it, and they were going to sit on it and not even give us the rights back. So wow. we had to talk them off the ledge on that. Wow. And uh, so it came up at least a year later, probably longer than, than what it was intended. And we thought it was done. <laughs> no one will read it. The ideas are finished. And actually, you know, God's economy probably landed at the right time. Yeah, and I would say it was it was disruptive is a language that I might use. Yeah. And because I did, I mean, I interacted with it positively and negatively. The things I did, Alan and I would talk later about, you know, I, I probably have a maybe what we might call higher and lower doesn't mean good or bad, but but I have a higher ecclesiology on some things than than I, you know, that I saw in shaping and other things. And so I actually interacted some with that. Yes. Um, but it was, it, I think the key thing is it hit at the right time. And yes, part of the right time I think it hit at was that people were dissatisfied mm -hmm. with the church growth movement, with the, with the, um, and again, I don't want to caricature because, because I think, I think that's what happened. I think that's unfair to people. But what I think many in the church growth movement would now say was an overemphasis on leadership, though now I think some of the missional church movement needs to not be afraid of leadership ideas, but mm -hmm. an overemphasis on leadership, the, often the CEOization of mm -hmm. pastoral leadership. The There's business. a certain type of leadership, I think, you know, more the CEO, yeah. like you're saying. Right, right, for, for sure, for sure. So, so this comes and it's disruptive in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way that causes people to shape and have conversations uh, and also, too, because Alan has, uh, you know, I mean, particularly as the emerging church, as parts of the emerging church, you know, eventually veer off out of what we would consider orthodox as evangelical Christians. Um, and as that, that happens, still to see the missional church conversation, as there's still a place where you can engage emerging cultures, you can live on mission, you don't have to be like the inherited models that you may yeah. dislike. Um and and so so I think that became a key thing. So having somebody in that space where both, you know, Mike and Alan are um, very countercultural in both cases, mm -hmm. um, very well not Americans, mm -hmm. um, talking about mission, doing so with a commitment to see the the Bible understood and engaged people coming to faith in Christ and being transformed by the power of the gospel. I think people said, okay, these guys are. You guys are not where I am on everything, but they're fellow travelers. Mm -hmm. And I love the future travelers would be something Ader, Alan would later uh, would later, later articulate. And then, you know, but eventually you got to remember too, I mean, mainstream, Keller is the mainstream. Yeah. So Keller, so, and even what I thought was fascinating when, when, when Alan Hirsch started to do work with Tim Keller, <laughs> I thought this is this. Is, it's like I don't even. It's like a crossover it's episode. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, Tim's a gorgeous man. He's just a, a privilege to work with. But yes, uh, yeah, and uh, but yes, definitely more of the kind of the the more conservative side of the equation. Well, and if, uh, if we trace things back to two thousand. There, I mean, you, I mean, the, the restoration movement obviously is a big part of seeing at least church planting, see a resurgence in that decade, uh, whether it be... Wait, wait, restoration movement, are you talking about? Or, or you're thinking about like the stadias and the, yeah, yeah. the exponential. Okay, so yeah, that stream that, that Alan is in. So just right. restoration movement well, being... I hold very lightly. I mean, I, just... Well, that's the whole point of the restoration yeah, movement. Nominationalism. Yeah. Everyone's, we love everybody. Yeah. I'm yeah. not in the restoration movement. Um, and yeah, there's, a, there's a context to at least, you know, maybe 20 years of church planting um, that, that came out of a lot of that energy that I think was stirred up. Oh, that's interesting. Um, it, so this is where I want to go now, because a part of me feels like, um, you know, 
I think you and I have had this conversation that church planting doesn't have the same appeal that it did uh, in those decades. For sure, I agree. Um, it's it's mainstream now, and so it's mainstream yeah, now, yeah, yeah. and um, and a part of it is uh, the thought leadership that you guys have provided had have has been valuable. You know, I'm not much younger than 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 you. I think I'm maybe ten years younger than Ed. Um, but I don't know, like, what is stirring up the energy for the next 20 mm-hmm. decades. So let's talk about that. Um, what what about the missional movement needs to be pulled into the next 20 years? And mm-hmm. who are you seeing? Uh, what are you what are you hoping for the emerging thought leaders to not forsake about the missional church movement? But there may be some things where they shouldn't pull forward into the future, especially as you're trying to stir up energy towards mission. Hmm. Um, so well, let's go there because I think that's, to me, for those who are leading mission organizations in North America, they know that the, the solution isn't to build better systems uh, or to maintain their processes mm-hmm. or to build another pipeline. Like they know that. Part of it is they're sensing it's a lack of imagination for what does mission look like for the next 20 years. And so um, how can we help emerging thought leaders to, uh, to ideate in this space and to again, to, to put out a call. And I think that's really what, what the both of you did in the 2000s for many of us was you put out a call and it, uh, and people responded to. So, Ed, uh, 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 Alan, let's go to you first. Um, you know, if you're coaching, mentoring, emerging thought leaders and, you know, they're going to pull this forward through the next 20 years, what are you telling them to do? Well, um, again, I'll, I'll repeat perhaps that one of the challenges is that if there really isn't a plan B on this. I think we have to um, either recover or recalibrate the term missional, but I, I don't know where we go to if we don't have that. So one is to recognize that we come to an impasse. To, is that how Americans would say it? Imp, would say an impasse. Yeah, but yeah, it's, it's hard. Yeah. And, and that's the, you know, the, there is no retreat from, you know, there's no way back. What, what has got us here is not going to get us there. And we simply have to, exercise our deepest imagination and and I would argue activate our deepest instincts. Um, I would say one of the challenges is please resist the temptation to go plug and play all technical on this. The great danger is that we don't address the fundamental mental model that sustains our current way of thinking. If we keep trying to you know sustain that model, and I mean, I mean the, the paradigm, um, and keep trying to do all kinds of mission. It'll be either co-opted, become plug and play, and plug and play ends up like in two, three years' time. Ah, yeah, we tried that, didn't work, and then you've stuck. Um, so I think that the I think the the great challenge is to to rethink the paradigm. And I, I've been on it for years, and I still think it's the issue. Uh, but I think the tend to you know so reinvent, but but certainly think carefully about the the kind of the mental model, you know, and partly because if I if just play with a mental model, mental map idea is that I would argue that most of our maps uh, were formulated in different years and different times. And I would argue that most of the way, even the American church, and this will be hard for Americans to, 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 to swallow, but effectively is really a missional, uh, sorry, a, a European understanding of the church. Uh, the fundamental ecclesiology uh, that we've inherited came from Europe. It wasn't from the Bible. It was the Christendom understanding. And uh, it's yes, it became all entrepreneurial under America, but the fundamental model, our basic, con- our basic definitions were probably more from the Reformation if you're Protestant. Um, and, um, you know, which is still, they really didn't grapple with the ecclesiological issue. So, and I think that's the problem. And so I would argue uh, if to focus the conversation, my approach here would be, I still use the word mission, of course, but um, uh, because I don't think it's a plan B, uh, give me a better one, uh, show me the better way. But, but I would say I now really focus the efforts on the idea of becoming a movement. In other words, um, on the ecclesiological issue to force us to think about how do you embody and express missionality. And I think the missional, the, the, the movement is the most in history, I think it's, this is un, un, I think it's un, it can't be challenged. I think in history, the movement is our best 
expression of missionality. Uh, and I think, therefore, by focusing on that and the kinds of things that have to change for us to become movemental, uh, I think really focuses our efforts on not just the, the the kind of paradigm, because you need a different paradigm of church to be a movement, but you also have to have different um, habits, practices, tools uh, that are consistent with movement. And so much of the things we do undermine it. Um, so, yes, it's, I think, a very thorough audit of the prevailing system. Find a different mental model. And here's the other thing, too, I think, you know, for church planters. Actually, in the Bible, you're never commanded to plant churches. Do you know that? I mean, I, again, I can't find that, even though I believe in it, so I don't hear what I'm not saying. But uh, but uh, actually, the Bible commits us to gospel planting, and that's come as something prior to church. The problem is when we use the word church, Darn if it isn't, we've always got a pulpit. Or if you're Pentecostal, it's got some bouncy band in it. It doesn't necessarily, those are just no, ways of expressing. Yeah. Um, but 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 why don't you plant the gospel and let Jesus build the church, right? He says he will. So plant the Jesus story. This is the contextualize it and, and let the church emerge out of what Jesus builds. And I think that's just a useful way of thinking. The other thing I say to people, don't uh, plant churches, plant movements. Begin with the end in mind. And if you want to move in something that can scale and have a huge impact and go the distance and transform society, you've got to design it in to the, to the very foundation. So it forces us to think about the mental model right up front. Don't plant churches. We've got enough of those suckers. We need movements now. Movements will change the world. So that's and what about you? What are you? What are you telling younger leaders? what to pull into the future. I don't, I don't think I would disagree with, I think I'd affirm, I think almost everything Alan just said, maybe everything he just said. That's um, incredible. It is. It is unusual. Cause I mean, it's just, it's a professor in, thing. So, and it's worth noting. I've got it. Alan, incre ed, incre edible, edible, ed, ed, you know, okay. It's lost. Wow. That, 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 that was awkward. Incredible. Um, so, um, <laughs> I, I would say that, you know, Alan is a, um, he is a pastoral prophet, mm. prophetic pastorally. Let's do this. Let's do this together. Let me speak into this. And I'm, uh, I'm in a different role. You know, I'm a professor. And, you know, from when I wrote Planning New Churches in a Postmodern Age, 2003, you pointed out, I, I had to get my timeline right. You know, now I'm, I lead Lausanne, North America. You know, I'm the regional director for the Lausanne Global Mission Movement. So... So for me, the question I asked that were to reflect and respond to your question is I want to elevate voices like Alan's, uh, not that he needs my elevation, but voices like Alan's that may not be, you know, as known, who are calling for alternative forms, approaches, and structures to say, let's give them space and place to see what the Lord is doing in that context. Let's give them space and place to push back on the inherited forms that are not driven by scripture, but are driven by, uh, as he talked about, European culture or Christendom or more. And so I love that. Um, but at the same time, I'm trying to, and this is, this, is the, this is the course I'm teaching at Oxford this fall. So I'm literally, the mission to Western culture focus is, is so I'm approaching this as how also, I'll, I'll speak this summer at the Evangelical Presbyterian Church General Assembly. So how do I help the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, the long heritage and history, um, from the Reformed tradition, how do I help them do what the writer of Hebrews says, provoke them to love and good deeds, which what I think are now mainstream ideas mm -hmm. that mission is rooted in the identity of God himself. We should, the churches should be, you know, driven by mission, not have mission as a department. And I think those are mainstream ideas. Uh, I think most pastors have probably heard them. Uh, and they've been, and Concordia seminaries have taught the Missio, Missio Dei course for decades. But how do we actualize this? Mm -hmm. So I think for, so I, I kind of want to hold two things at the same time. I want to make room and space for alternative mission-driven uh, expressions of mission, church, and more. And I still think, uh, and maybe, and I think Alan does this too, but maybe because of the places and in institutional evangelicalism where I found myself, um, how do I help them be more mission driven. And I, it's interesting to even watch Alan's ministry. You know, I remember when, you know, Alan was like that, that to, to us, he was like this indie rock band mm. that sudden became, you know, he be became mainstream. 
So, you know, all of a sudden he's partnering with these movements and these churches and he's working with <laughs> new thing or is up with, you know, Keller, I mentioned and others. Um, but I, when you hear Alan talk, he still hadn't lost that edge. The place for good or for ill where I am is often in, I mean, gosh, I'm at Wheaton college, right? You know, I, I, I'm the editor of a magazine. I'm whatever is I'm still trying to push and push people towards an actualization of what I think, um, is now a mainstream view. I mean, I think one thing, you know, Alan and I could just go home and say what we talked about in 2003 is now the mainstream view. And I don't have to be the person who helps people think that the next, I, mean, I got to raise up the next generation mm -hmm. to help do that. But so for me, I feel part of my role, and I hope you've seen this in, in, in your service, what we've served together here, is to make space and place for people who might push different directions as you have with us and simultaneously to help the movement, I'm primarily focused on evangelicalism, to help the movement continue to, well, move to a greater actualization of what I think is now a mainstream idea about mission that is not way widely embraced. So one of the things that I, you know, coming out of COVID, we saw a lot of churches stand up, stand out, um, you know, stand in the gap, show and share the love of Jesus and be engaged at mission at a higher level. I mean, think about right. the years that Alan Hirsch and I have done podcasts and angsty articles and books saying the church needs to leave the building. And every church left the building right. in early right. 2020. And some people <laughs> stepped up, not, not, not the majority. So how can I help? And this is why I'll talk about this this summer at some of the denominations I'm speaking at. How can I help that normalize this greater engagement of mission? And that's in established churches as well. So there's, I think there's, I hate to do the both end thing, but I do think that it really matters uh, that we have space and place for people mm -hmm. To, to basically do missiological experimentation. And it matters that we help the vast majority of Christians are in established churches that, that for all the theological differences do look structurally similar to one another and we can help them live on mission. So I, that, that's kind of where I wanna pull forward to answer your question. Yeah, yeah Well, young leaders might end into those missiological experiments, but most of them are actually gonna end up into established churches and they're gonna have to walk that and how do they make that, how do they have that mission driven emphasis there? Yeah, it's good. Well, I hope you uh, found this conversation helpful with uh, Ed and Alan, and uh, thanks so much to the both of you for uh, having this conversation. Uh, much of what we're going to be focusing on at the Church Multiplication, Multiplication Institute is to do exactly what Ed said, is to create the spaces so that these conversations can be held uh, by uh, next generation leaders, emerging leaders, because uh, this is pertinent to uh, the ministry moving forward for church planning organizations as they're thinking about not just how to plant uh, more churches, but how to plant the right kinds of churches that are going to reach all kinds of people. So we appreciate uh, you tuning in, and uh, we look forward to uh, more resources coming out that could be helpful to you in the work that you're doing at your organizations.